Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. The scripture comes from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 5. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The, woman, the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you, Ring Out. It is a beautiful day. Happy Easter, everyone. Welcome to Emmanuel United Church of Christ on this, our most joyous day. I'm Pastor Rachel. This is our student, Pastor Joseph. Our liturgist is Melissa today. And all of these people are here to say hallelujah. Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. Whether you are here in person or joining us online, we are so glad you're here. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, whether this is your first time here or your 5,000th, you are welcome here. I wanna give you a heads up. Today's service has several special elements. And so there are some instructions. The first special element is that our choir has been resurrected from the COVID tomb. <laughs> and we are grateful indeed. We also will have a rite of confirmation for one of our confirmands who was not able to be here last week when his fellow confirmands were confirmed. And our confirmands all together will receive their first communion together before the rest of us receive our communion. 
and we will have communion. So if you are joining us online, you may take a moment to get some bread, or crackers, juice, or wine, something that will bring you into this ritual together with us, and we will bless those at the same time we bless ours. And finally, a note for the children. We will have during the last verse of our opening hymn, that's the next song, the next time the organ strikes up. If you are a child here and you would like to participate, you and your grown-ups, if they would like, can go back to the lobby back there and get a bell and you'll get to come and ring the bell on the last verse. Someone is demonstrating for us. And we will also have a children's time early in the service. And after that, children, kindergarten and below are invited to the nursery if they want. They are also invited to stay here. Either is fine. Children and children at heart of all ages are welcome here at all times. Happy Easter. During the season of Lent and this last week in Holy Week, we focused on growing gardens tending the life that is right in front of us, rather than constantly climbing ladders of this world that it defines as success. We have been embracing good enough lives and good enough selves that are worthy of love no matter what. We have been acknowledging the suffering that is a natural part of life, and we have practiced compassion as we deal with the realities and limitations that invite us to let go of perfectionism and the incessant drive towards something other than our real, holy, and blessed regardless lives. And now we encounter Easter. It is a day we proclaim that while death is a part of life, even little deaths along the way of dreams, of love, of the way we thought life would go, even though this is a part of life, we are part of a faith that invites us to consider the good gardener that is always tending us, abiding with us beyond any kind of death that faces us. Below the surface of the soil, the broken down elements of what was, there are seeds germinating. And today the green blade riseth from the buried grain Alleluia, Christ is risen indeed. Now, if you all would please join me in our opening prayer. Let us pray. Holy One, you whose love endures forever, you keep offering us new life and hope no matter what. We praise you for you are our strength and our salvation. We shall not die, but live for you call us into the light, encouraging us to reach for the sun, unfurl our full colors, and know that we are held in the deep and rich soil of your garden. This is more than good enough. This is the blessing of life. In Christ's holy name we pray, amen. And now it is with great pleasure that I would like to invite all of you to join me in singing our opening hymn. And I suggest you sing with great gusto and stand. <laughs>
awesome. Woo! Is everybody excited enough? <laughs> All the kids come up front and young at heart. Whoever wants to. I got stuff for everybody. Oh, okay. oh good timing. Good timing. Oh, and we got hats. I don't think that hat was for you, Brady, but that's okay. Oh, and we got, is it, is it Smushmallow? Squishmallow. Squishmallow. Oh, I love Squishmallow. Looks like the Easter Bunny brought some Squishmallows. They're squishy. They're squishy. They're good and fluffy, like Easter Bunnies. Yeah. Okay. Whew. It's been a busy morning. But happy Easter. Happy Easter. So those who've been here throughout Lent, you know we had a big ladder over here and lots and lots of plants, right? And we took care of the plants. Now look at the whole sanctuary. There's flowers everywhere. Our garden grew. It does smell good. It might make some people want to sneeze. I completely understand that. I took extra medicine for that because I'm allergic as well. But so all through Lent, we took care of the garden, right? We made when it went, one of the plants was too tiny and it needed a bigger pot. We put it in the bigger pot, right? And then we put fertilizer on it. And what was the thing with fertilizer? Mm -hmm. It was stinky. It was a little stinky. But not all stinky things are bad, right? It makes it grow. Fertilizer is good stuff, even though it smells. And then when Pastor Rachel was wilting, what did we do? Remember? We gave her a blanket. We gave her a blanket and food water. and water. And what did we give her at the very end? Uh, hugs. Big hugs and love. And then she came back to life and was able to do the rest of worship. We did, yeah, but then we gave her real hugs too, right? Yeah, we did give it to her on a piece of paper, and then that might have been a little documentation, a little funny, right? And then we, put, we planted seeds, and then today everybody's going to get seed packets when we leave so that we can keep our gardens growing everywhere we go. And then I made you all some special bags. I'm going to ask Joseph to pass me one because it's Easter. We gave you special stuff. So I have a few things today to help you remind you that not only do we are we gardeners in life, right? That we plant things and we take care of the earth that God asks us to take care of, that God gave us a bunch of stuff to be creative about. So one of the things you get is a background and some stickers. You actually get two backgrounds, so you can color one of them. And you get to redo the Easter story with these cool stickers. Yeah, we had one at Advent for Christmas, yeah. And then in there also is your normal children's bulletins, per usual. And then I found these cool books at none other than Target, and they're completely blank. So you know what you get to do? Write a story, draw pictures, write a journal. I don't care if it's po do whatever you do, because there's no rules on this. It's yours. There's nothing that says there's no lines, so it doesn't have to be written, especially if we can't write yet. That's fine. It can be pictures, it can be anything you want. And from page to page, it doesn't have to make sense, because it's all yours. <laughs> I know, right? I tell you, some things don't have to make sense. And then there's this really cool thing that I found, and it's a woven cross. Isn't that cool? So you're going to get it in pieces. So I did mine already. For you all, it looks like this, and it's double-sided, super fun. And so you get these little strips, and you get this, and you get to put it together. Now, when you put it together, there's going to be extra pieces all over the place. So when you get home, you're going to have to like do some cutting and some gluing a little bit. But I'm sure there's going to be some people there today to help you with it. And I want you to have all these things because, first of all, it's Easter. And Jesus rose from the dead for this day. So it's kind of a big deal, right? And I think God wants us to use our creativity and to do things that make us happy. And I think sometimes things like this, they make us happy. People planting and, and putting stuff in the ground makes them happy. And it's pretty. And I think our world need, always needs a little more pretty things, right? And after you make this, you can give it to somebody or you can put it up in your room or wherever you want. Same thing with your book. You can do whatever you want with it. You can ask for help. There's also crayons and, oh, there is instruction sheets too, and pencils in there as well. So there's a bunch of stuff in there and you can't mess up any of it. You know that? Not a single thing can you mess up in this bag because it's all for you. Because the whole Lent, we were talking about being good enough, right? Because God made us. We're pretty amazing because God made us. And no matter what we do, it's going to be okay. There's going to be days that we really try hard and we get it all right and we do the best we can. There are other days that we're tired. And it just doesn't seem to work. And you know what? That's okay because we got the next day and we're going to keep trying the next day. Thank you. And then we're going to do our prayer. Remember our repeat after me prayer? We're going to do it one more time, okay? It's real simple. Ready? 
I look at you. I look at you. I look at me. I look at me. I celebrate. I celebrate what I see. What I see. Cause God made all. God made all. The smooth and the rough. The smooth and the rough. No matter what. No matter what. You're good enough. You're good enough. Amen. Amen. And then we'll pass some bags out for you. There you go. Can everybody get you a bag? Yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody take one. We got plenty. I made plenty. What you wouldn't do? Oh, Hold on, I'll everybody. Okay, you took like, you took like two. We got two over here, thank you. I need one. Oh, I need an extra one then. Whoa! My hat, my hat, boy. Oh, you match too. Yeah. Oh, goodness, I love it. I got one more. As they find their seats, I want to invite us into a time of meditation. We each week have a time of confession, not because we want to think about how bad we are, but because we want to find ways to let go of those things that distract us from being able to live fully in God's love. Easter can be tricky. When it comes to the life of faith, we come for the happy ending and the they lived happily ever after. The resurrection story proclaims hope over despair and life over death. And yet we know that life in faith is cyclical. It's why we do this every year. It's a story of spiking heartbreak moments that are not forever fixed, mixed with moments of resurrection and the surprising ability to find joy even in the midst of sorrow. The nature of being created for love is that we will always hunger for more and that there never feels like enough life and love to satisfy and sometimes the endings come too soon. But perhaps it is good enough, indeed truly good, to accept the chronic nature of being human with an eye for resurrection moments that assure us that this good enough life is worthy of our amazement. And so I invite you to imagine in a moment of silence, the deep seed and shoot that is growing within you, yearning for light and life. Hear this compassionate word from the prophet Isaiah. I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. Already. God is offering us freedom from the fear of isolation and the anguish at endings, inviting us to community and creativity for new life, unexpected life, unending love. And know that despite sometimes our faltering steps, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are being forgiven even now. Glory to God. Amen.
I have missed that. <laughs> I like dancing up here. The second reading today is going to come is John chapter 20 verses 1 through 18. And it's paraphrased by Kate Bowler and Jessica Ritchie in the book Good Enough. The sun hadn't peaked over the horizon yet. The greenish haze of the moon offers barely enough light to move about. And according to John's gospel, Mary Magdalene is awake. Grief does that to you. A day stretches into night. The moon chases the sun into day again. The circadian rhythm cannot win against the restlessness of an unsettled mind or a broken heart. Days before, Mary's beloved friend and teacher was murdered. The Sabbath meant burial preparation had to be left unfinished. And as soon as the clock released her, Mary made her way back to the tomb. But when she arrived, the stone had been moved. Jewish custom took seriously the first seven days of grieving, so to strip people from enacting final acts of love would have been a cruelty to fragile mourners. Even Gentile grave robbers would have left the body behind out of respect. She takes off to find Peter and John who confirm her fear. The body is missing. And yet the bed has been made. The pieces of cloth they swaddled him in are perfectly folded in his steed. Undone by the layered grief, the men didn't linger, but head home. First, they lose their teacher and friend. Now his body has been desecrated too. It is too much for anyone to bear. I wonder if they will try to get Mary to come along to leave this place of death and get some sleep. The bags under her bloodshot eyes must have given away her exhaustion, but instead she stays, hosted at the last place she saw Jesus, like a soldier keeping watch. She peers inside the tomb again. This time it isn't empty, but she doesn't see who she's looking for. Two people dressed in white sit where Jesus once lay. Why are you crying? A rather heartless question to ask in a cemetery. Heaving through sobs, she tells them what's wrong. They've taken him. Then turning to leave, she nearly bumps into a man with dirt under his fingernails. He too asks her, why are you crying? Through her tear blurred eyes, she mistakes him for the gardener and begs him to tell her where Jesus' body lies. Mary doesn't recognize that the gardener is Jesus, not until he calls her by name, like a gardener who can name every variation of plant growing in his plot. What is it about this voice that feels so recognizable? What is it about your name on a familiar tongue that feels so comforting? Finally, Mary knows. Rabbi, she exhales with the weight of despair, my dearest teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. For those of you who may not have been here for every Sunday in Lent, you may have heard the phrase good enough a number of times and wonder, what is that about? We have been using a book by Kate Bowler and Jessica Ritchie called Good Enough, 40-ish devotionals for an imperfect life. And so we are going to, during our sermon, read a couple of excerpts from that as well. And I'm going to invite Joseph forward to do that. So when he speaks, you can imagine a 40 something year old white woman who has uh, got a stage four cancer uh, and has been living in remission for a few years, because that is Kate Bowler uh, in a nutshell. Uh, she is also a divinity professor at Duke University. You're looking the part just beautifully. <laughs> Would you pray with me? God, on this resurrection morning, rise in our hearts. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
What a strange detail. The resurrected Christ is mistaken for a gardener. Maybe it was what he could find in the gardener's shed, needing something to replace the shroud. Maybe it was a reference to the last place he'd prayed, the place he'd been seized. Maybe, as Bowler suggests, Jesus looks like his dad, the first gardener who tended Eden barefoot. Maybe Jesus looks like the new Adam, the head gardener for the new heavens and the new earth. Maybe it's because he carries the pruning shears of a vine dresser, the careful tender of our souls, ready to pluck and plant, uproot and cut back. Maybe he looks like he's ready to cultivate new life, to pull us toward resurrection with his fingers digging among thorns. Or maybe this gardener looks like he knows something about hope, hope that Mary desperately needs. A gardener knows the kind of hope it takes to sow a seed in the ground, to cover it with manure, to bury it in the cold winter dirt surrounded by naked trees. It was just two days ago that this beloved man for whom Mary is looking was hung on one of those naked trees, one that had been cut down never to grow again, death hung upon death. You would forgive her for thinking that hope seemed like a useless proposition and that the body seeming to have been stolen and desecrated was the most likely scenario, even if Jesus had said that he would rise again. Who could believe that? after such devastation. But if there's anyone who knows that new life is possible even after devastation, it's a gardener. It's one who sees the ways that rotten and spotted and moldy and withered food fades into compost, mixes together its nourishment and becomes fertile soil for the next seed. It's the one who knows that seeds themselves are the husks of what was once, the end stage after the beauty has withered. And yet they are also the purpose of the plant. They are the way life continues. A gardener knows about seeds. A seed really has no purpose until it's planted by a good gardener. Yet inside a tiny seed is all the genetic information needed to grow into a complete plant. And under the right conditions, this tiny speck will sprout and root, bud and bloom. What grows might provide food, shelter, or awe. Sometimes a giant sequoia or a bush weighed with juicy raspberries or a flamboyant peony. But the first step to creating new life from this insignificant package, you must bury it. A seed reaches its potential only when it's buried, when things look most lost, most dark, most covered, most long gone, most hopeless. That's when the seed is undergoing the most important change. Through its death, it might produce much fruit. Seeds must be buried, but some need even more drastic circumstances to allow for new life to bust through the thick seed coat. Some need to be exposed to almost freezing temperatures before they will germinate. Sequoia seeds germinate only when burnt. Some seeds, when ballooned with water, finally burst open. Some, when they are kept in pitch black for a long time, Hard-shelled seeds must be scarred, cracked, or manually broken open. Some need to be eaten by animals and, ahem, released. (laughs) And still others must sit dormant for several years before something mysterious triggers them to sprout. And that first burst of life that breaks through the seed coat after it's been buried, it's called the radical. This gardener knows the hope it takes to believe that through the death, the freezing, the fire, the floods, the darkness, the crushing, 
the consumption and the waiting. Even there, new life can be born. And this is the radical moment of new life bursting forth from seeming death. Why do you look for the living among the dead? The angel said. Perhaps it's not a scoffing question as it is often read. Perhaps one looks there because that's where new life begins. A gardener focuses on this moment of transferring from death to life. A farmer knows this too, but a farmer is concerned with things that involve markets and feeding and making sure that enough crops grow. Whereas a gardener has a more intimate, maybe smaller scale relationship with each single plant, knows what it looks like, plucks the leaves that are no longer producing life the gardener is a little more about love and spirit than expediency or financial gain. They are bigger time wasters. We give thanks to God for farmers, for we would all starve without them. The image of the gardener is a little bit different. Why would this gardener go through the process? Why bother? Why go through the work and the heartache, the backache? the knee ache, some of you know it very well, of gardening, when a farmer could do it so much better and more efficiently, and we could just buy it from the grocery store. I have, since I moved to Kentucky, now 10 years ago, started dabbling in amateur gardening very much inefficiently. It is a ridiculous act of hope, I got particularly obsessed with the Japanese eggplant that I had one time cooked so deliciously that I was determined to grow one again on my own and cook it. And in Berea, where I lived for five years, I tried this and got one eggplant for five years. When we moved to Louisville, I replanted. I got one eggplant and a squirrel ate it. <laughs> and then last year, all of a sudden, five bloomed. And it was like my birthday and Christmas and Easter all rolled into one. And yes, maybe I let it go too long and did not actually get to cook that meal that I had been dreaming of because it withered on the vine. But the joy of it, I had poured so much money and time into this garden bed, into the wood carefully placed, the soil purchased, amended, made compost for it, all to get this beautiful, and it was beautiful, little eggplant. It was an extreme waste of resources. You can call it artisanal if you like, but really, it was a waste. And yet, anyone who has harvested fruit that they grew themselves knows the joy and the pride and the delight that comes in being part of the mystery that creates new fruit, beautiful flowers, healthy plants. In the book, The Little Prince, the little prince who has lived alone on a little tiny planet where he tends to a single rose that he loves lavishly, ridiculously, with so much time and wasted energy. Goes off of that planet for a while and meets a fox and he talks to that fox about the rose and why that rose is different from the other roses that he sees on earth. And the fox tells him, it is the time you have wasted for your rose that makes your rose so important. There is a sense about the gardener, the gardener who pours lavish love 
when it doesn't necessarily need to be that way, onto each of us, onto each little plant, tending, nurturing, sometimes plucking the parts that aren't working, until that joy comes upon the gardener of that new life and that good fruit. As Bowler says, maybe this is what it means to be an Easter person, to see Christ and think gardener, not as a mistaken identity, but a prophetic one. The good news of Easter is that God loves us more than a puny eggplant, more than the tenderest rose, loves us enough to call us by name and cultivate our cemeteries into gardens. Mary goes from the devastation of grief to becoming the first preacher of the resurrection, the first harbinger of hope. And she goes and she tells the good news and others tell it as well as they experience it. And they become part of a community of people who testify to one another that when the going gets hard, when death comes again, as it must, as it does, still with great harshness, despite the power of resurrection. These seeds of testimony keep germinating, keep growing again and again after every winter. The church that began as a few disciples becomes a worldwide movement of hope because we need this image of a garden. We need to be reminded that our failures are not worthless. Our griefs are not for naught. All of them contain some bit of life and life will find a way to bloom. It's the life that shows up in the dinner after the funeral where memories become stories, become raucous laughter. It's the handmade cards sent to those who can't come into a building reminding them that they are remembered and loved. It's people like Waterstep, the organization that has figured out how to turn used shoes into funding for clean water, giving literal life to those who would otherwise be priced out of it. It's people from a church showing up on a busy Saturday before Easter, foregoing the process of making ham and deviled eggs in order to help a family move into a new home. It's the preaching of the resurrection that comes with U-Hauls and grunts and groans and a lot of ibuprofen. <laughs> the Easter church, the garden church, the resurrection church is made up of all of us, seeds planted in various difficult ways, forming roots that intertwine, become connected, give each other nutrients and hope. The Easter church is seeds who have seen some things, still hoping to form a radical love, to reach forward once more with the green blade of new life. It is a beautiful garden, tended by the good gardener. Hallelujah. I would now like to offer you all a blessing for you who are being planted. Blessed are you who are buried, you who feel stuck in the depths of grief and despair or who sit in the pit of unknowing, you who are learning to trust in the timing of a tender gardener. Blessed are you who are growing, you who burst with new life, fresh creativity, who understand the pain that sometimes comes with stretching and changing, pruning and being cut back. And blessed are you in your season of fruitfulness, you who are learning to abide in the vine and who taste the sweetness of God's loving kindness, the God who was there all along, planting, waiting, watering, pruning, and delighting the God who pays careful attention to God's gardener. Amen.
We invite you to rise in body and spirit and join us in our song of celebration. <laughs> It is now time for our tithes and offerings. Would you please pray with me? On this day, we remember that Mary Magdalene arrived at the tomb with the intent to anoint the crucified body of Jesus and astonished she find an empty tomb where Jesus once lay. The resurrection narrative reveals that love is alive and moves among us. The risen Christ helps us to remember that despair is not the end of our journey. The risen Christ also speaks of God's ever-present love and that the church resurrection hope. In that, as an Easter people, we manifest God's never-ending love in the world by giving of our time, talents, and financial resources. For it is with Christ's limitless and restorative love that we humbly and graciously offer back to God a portion of what God has given us. Amen. So as promised, we invite you now to celebrate the sacraments of Holy Communion with us. You have responses printed in your bulletin and on the screens to join in when prompted. The God of resurrection be with you. And also with you. People of Easter morning, lift up your hearts. People of Easter's joy, give thanks to the one who raises us to new life. We sing our to God of love. Let us pray. O oh, great gardener, you walked in paradise calling forth new life from the soil, even human life. You caused it to rain upon the ground and sent forth rivers to water your garden, and you set us to till it and keep it. Even when violence entered your world, when we watered your garden with the blood of our siblings, you still tended to us, offering us mercy, even in days of disobedience and of drought. Your love soaked our soil and you kept us warm with the glow of your compassion. As a community of faith, we grow in a garden of ours and with others, saintly seeds who have sent up their best shoots of faith. Some of them sit around with us now. Some are represented in the beautiful garden of our memories and these flowers here around us. All are part of the great lushness of your creation. Therefore, with the entire company of saints in heaven and on earth, we worship and glorify you saying, holy, 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 holy God, God of love and, and majesty, majesty 
the whole universe speaks of your glory. O God most high, blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God. Hosanna in the highest. Your greatest gift to us was Jesus, who told stories of gardeners who were abundant in their sowing, who raised surprisingly large plants from itsy bitsy seeds, and who tended to bodies and souls like a gardener, coaxing and nurturing them into new life. And he invited us to garden with him. But his pronouncements about abundant life were too terrifying for the powers that sought to take over the garden. They sought to kill him, but what they did was bury a seed of new life. Through the empty tomb, we trumpet like these lilies that life and love have won. And on this day of resurrection, we worship you, O oh God, for all the blessings you have planted among us. And therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has, has died, died, Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. We remember the voice of the risen Christ, calling our names and reminding us that the body broken becomes food for new life. The cup once poured out in sacrifice has become the nourishing blood of life. And so we pray, pour out your Holy Spirit, O God, bless these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine. May they nurture us even if we feel impossibly buried in the earth. Transform us, making the deserts and wildernesses within us like Eden, that we might join in Christ's gardening work, tending to the world around us. Amen. Friends, we will first call our, our confirmands up for their first communion as full members of this church. They will be surrounded by parents and their mentors. And then our communion servers will come forward and uh, carry these trays out to you. This is the first time we've had this real bread in two years. You can see on the back of your bulletin, it's from 2020. <laughs> and so we will say a great hallelujah. You will find as the trays come by you, there is juice in the purple center cups and there is wine in the clear outer cups. Once all has been passed, I will invite us to eat the bread together and then drink the cups together. And we will close together in prayer. Let us begin. This is the bread of life. Take to eat and know that you are loved and broken in the
Beloved, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, remember that you are loved beyond measure. Now we will open the way so that the rest of the congregation <laughs> can participate with us. This is the bread of life broken for you, that you may have new and glorious life. Take, eat, and remember.
This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. Each time you drink it, remember that it was a gift to you for the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of new life. Drink and remember. Friends, let us pray, and I will invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. All praise to you, eternal gardener, through Jesus Christ, who calls us by name in the world when our hearts feel buried in despair, and through the Holy Spirit, in whom we take root and through whose encouragement we bloom. We give you thanks, and we pray as Jesus taught us, reaching to you as our maker, our mother, and our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now may the God who loves all of creation, even the broken bits, and Jesus who is our companion on this crooked path called life, and the Holy Spirit who finds ways to improvise through it all, bless you, be with you, and nurture you all the days of your life. Go in peace and joy. Happy Easter. <laughs>